honor that you have joined us. So my name is Michelle. I am currently here in Amiskwichi, Waskayagan, Edmonton Treaty 6 territory. It is a beautiful sunny day. It's like, it feels like plus 30 out there. It feels like beach weather. Um, so it's a really gorgeous day. Wherever you are, I hope your day, I hope the sun is shining wherever you are. So first and foremost, I think it's important to just give thanks to Creator for the gift of another day, a gift of being able to be in community. I know it's not ideal, but we're still able to connect and communicate virtually. So welcome to Innovate BC. Super excited um, for today's presentation. Our guest speaker is Chief Willie Sellers, uh, and his presentation is Cannabis, Our Experience. So if there are any questions or comments along the way, please put it in the chat box. But there also will be opportunity at the end of this presentation. So there's going to be about 15 minutes or so um, where we can have dialogue, we can have questions, comments. So be prepared, come with some questions. Um, and we'd love to hear your voice to today's topic. So let me introduce our speaker today. It's my honor to um, introduce Chief Willie Sellers, who was born and raised in Williams, Lake BC and is a member of the Williams Lake First Nations. So elected onto WLFN Council at the age of 24 in 2008. Willie was one of the youngest elected councillors in WLFN history. So after serving 10 years on council, he was elected as the chief of William Lake's of Williams Lake First Nation in 2018 and currently is in his first term. In his previous work experience, Willie worked as a wildland firefighter for the Ministry of Forests, Lands and Natural Resource Operations before returning to his community to assume the position of Special Project Coordinator. During this time, he was responsible for new business initiatives flowing from impact benefit agreements, engagement with engagement with proponents in the traditional territory, and community consultation for the major WLFN projects. And I found this little bit of information um, the most outstanding. He is a published author of Dip Netting with Dad, which won a Moonbeam Children's Book Award and was shortlisted for the Choc Chocolate Lily, Shining Willow, and Ontario Library Association Awards. So his next book, Hockey with the Dad is due to be released in the fall of 2021. So keep an eye out for that, folks. We always love to support our Indigenous folks, authors, entrepreneurs. So we're looking forward to that book. Willie enjoys his family time with his three kids playing hockey with the Williams Lake Stampeders, attending community events at WLFN, dip netting, and playing fast ball. So that's just like a, a little glimpse of this um, chief, this young chief. So we're really honored that you have carved out a piece of your probably very busy schedule to share about what is going on in your community. So we welcome you and I'm going to pass the virtual mic to you. Wow, thank you for that uh, very warm introduction. I'm sitting here and I'm sweating uh from nervousness just based on the hype that you were able to put together in a sh few short uh, moments way white up everyone uh cook be willie sellers runs quest the keckles Mulu hello i am the chief of the williams lake first nation good day uh williams lake is located in the interior of british columbia in sequim territory three hours north of uh kamloops and two and a half hours uh, south of prince george uh, as you can imagine, uh, prayers and condolences go to KIB and the findings at the residential school. I know that's been something that uh, has really taken over the country in, um, you know, in a in a way that has impacted all of us um, 
both First Nation and non-First Nation moving forward. It's going to be interesting how those investigations roll out. We have a residential school located just six kilometers from our community, the St. Joseph's Mission, and that has been pretty much what's taken the majority of my time uh, over the last uh, week. And, you know, acknowledge what KIB has done in the reawakening of um, that warrior spirit uh, and just know, reminding us that, uh, that the reconciliation discussion is not something that um, that is uh, close to being done and, and we commend them and hold them up in more ways than one on the work that they've been done to raise awareness and now open the store to continue the healing journey that we're going to be going on over the coming months and years. Uh, it's very important to mention that because um, I know uh, everyone has, has heard and, and everyone's probably struggling their own way and trying to find uh, energy to focus on, on other things has been challenging. Uh, I know it has been very challenging for me and for, for the staff and just keeping that in the back of our minds while we grieve and mourn in our own way. Uh, we'll be starting a sacred fire tonight at WLFN for those people that weren't able to get down to KIB and, 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 and mourn in their way and provide blessing and prayer and give the opportunity to to drum and experience um, uh, that in person. Um, so yeah, it's been challenging times, but I uh, I look at this ride as um, the chief of my community and and you know, switching gears to some some positives and what we've been able to do around the cannabis front has been something that uh, that I'm very proud of. Um, very supportive council, which is very key, but also some very uh, key staff members that have really championed this process and made it easy on the politicians to lobby for it. Uh, so today we're gonna be talking about our experience in cannabis. Uh, it's been a very interesting journey actually. And uh, you know, not only just for the employment side of things, but breaking down uh, the the barriers and the mold of, of, of the business side of, of, of cannabis. Uh, it's funny, the president setting cannabis deal and we have a PowerPoint presentation that we're gonna be getting into and everyone will be able to see and uh, you know, uh, participate and ask questions on. But I had uh, somebody ask me as we're looking at expanding into Merritt, Vernon and Penticton now, uh, they said, wow, you must be so excited. You must be, I mean, this is crazy. You guys are expanding. That's exactly what you had envisioned. And, and I was saying, yeah, no, I mean, you really try and manage the, the ups and downs as a, as a leader in your community because there, you know, there's uh, some big ups and some big downs and trying to find that balance uh, in, in every single one of our, of our journeys is, has been the challenging thing. Yeah, I'm very excited about the cannabis stuff, but I'm putting into perspective on everything else that is going on and just trying to find um, uh, you know, the balance in my own way, whether it's making sure that I'm uh, taking advantage of the nice weather, as you mentioned, Michelle, and riding my motorbike or uh, getting to the hockey rink to, um, uh, to play hockey, one of my favorite sports, or just getting out by the water and hanging out with my kids, all very key. So today uh, is gonna be the WFN Cannabis Experience. I have my colleague, Mr. Kirk Dressler, uh, running the PowerPoint presentation for me. I'll be doing the speaking. He has been really the mastermind of our, um, of our journey here. I really uh, give him you know, a lot of the credit. I'm the politician and I'm the one that speaks well, but he's the one that does all the work and backs me up on a, on a day-to-day -day basis. So before we get started with the presentation, I would like to give him the opportunity to introduce himself as well. Oh, good afternoon. Um, thanks for having me this afternoon. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm excited to participate in this session with Chief Sellers. Certainly been an interesting ride on the campus experience with Williams Lake First Nation. Um, I'm the Director of Legal and Corporate Services at Williams Lake First Nation on the government side. I'm also the Chief Executive Officer of Sugarcane Development Corporation, Williams Lake First Nation's primary economic development entity, and also um, Coyote Rock Estates, our real estate development entity, and Sugarcane Cannabis um, and Unity Cannabis. Sugarcane Cannabis is our cultivation 
um, division of our cannabis enterprise and Unity Cannabis is the retail component um, of our cannabis enterprise. So thanks for having me. I'm, I'm uh, excited to support Chief Weller's sellers today. Okay, so let's get to the presentation. I'm not sure what kind of time limit we have. You have an hour. Oh, well, all right then. Do we have to take up the full hour? No, there's also okay. opportunity for questions <laughs> and comments. Give us another 15 minutes, we'll revamp this PowerPoint. <laughs> Just kidding, Kirk, just kidding. Uh, so WL found the cannabis experience. Okay, so prior, uh, so our entry into the cannabis industry, uh, prior to uh, October, 2018, uh, we had engaged um, the Solicitor General with the possibility of an agreement. So in the province of British Columbia, uh, they have these, the, the issue around, you know, growing and retail separated. So they, they give the jurisdiction to handle the retail component of the, of the legalization to the provinces. So in BC's, uh, um, in, in, in BC's, um, I'm trying to think of the uh, legislation, we are, there's a, um, a section 119 agreement that can be had with First Nation governments. That's under the Cannabis Control and Licensing Act. Uh, the Solicitor General advised that there was not an immediate prior priority, um, you know, but maybe in the coming years that they would be looking at inking these section 119 agreements with the province. Uh, we decided we didn't want to go the legalized route. I mean, they kept pushing us to, you know, get a license with the province, go that route. And we we're saying, no, we are going to, uh, we want our own specific agreement with the province. We think it should be different. You've, you've mentioned that there's specific agreements under the legislation and that's what we're going to be seeking moving forward. Uh, we, we understood that it wasn't appropriate that they would dictate to us, you know, um, what it was and we wanted a government to government agreement. That being said, uh, you know, we, we, we banged and crashed and we continued to, to lobby for this agreement. Before we um, did that, though, what we did was we, we brought it up at council. And I remember years following up to the legalization as we started the discussion at the council table. I was just a counselor at the time. Uh, working closely in economic development and and we wanted to get into the industry but of course we needed the blessing of the council we wanted to make sure that uh, the chief was okay with what we're doing and when we first started bringing it up at the table previous to 2018 of course it was just a dead stop no and that was very interesting we started to look at the uh the, the benefits of what the industry could do you know the revenue streams that it would create the um the employment opportunities that we would see from, you know, getting involved in this in industry, uh, a new industry that, you know, there is a ton of opportunity in. So eventually we, uh, we continued the dialogue at the council table and we were able to get full support, which was awesome. Uh, that kind of set us up for, okay, what are the next steps? We have full support from council moving forward. Now we're going to need to go to the community to uh, see what they think about it. So we enacted our own cannabis law and opened a retail cannabis outlet in March of 2019 on WLFN IR number six, which is which just happens to be located within the city of Williams Lake, which immediately created 11 full-time jobs. Um, the store boomed in its sale levels. There were immediate challenges with running business, of course. We, we decided because we hadn't uh, officially signed off on our section 119, our, our agreement that would make us legally able to sell cannabis. Uh, so. We were, um, because we were negotiating that agreement, we had moved into the gray market world. Uh, moving into the gray market world was, of course, interesting. We were able to have that gray market product, which you know, our sales were through the roof in our first year that we operated under that banner, that sovereignty model that you see right across Canada. Some of the problems that came up that we identified right away and made us feel very uncomfortable, uh, the inability to secure bank accounts under that model the inability to secure insurance, uh, dealing with a business partner that refused to pay out a profit share. I mean, there was all sorts of shady stuff uh, that uh, was going on that we were not comfortable with. We run a, a, a tight ship at WLFN. We have a lot of capacity. We have a supportive council, and this is just not the way that we do business. You know, dealing with product that may not have been properly tested or quality controlled is, is also a big one, making sure that there's that safe, healthy, um, Health Canada approved product getting out onto our shelves into the hands of, um, of, of 
the customers coming into the store. One of the interesting things as we went through uh, just backtracking up to the creation of our cannabis outlaw, we're a First Nation land management community. So we created that cannabis law um, in adhering to our land code and that community engagement process that's included in that. Uh, one of the interesting thing was unanimous support from the community. Uh, they, they envisioned cannabis as being a medicine and, and it's not like we sold them, but that's just how they identified with it right away. And, and is something that our you know, ancestors have used for hundreds of years. And the, the feedback was very interesting. The support was overwhelming. It kind of reinforced you know, what the strategy and vision was gonna be moving forward. You know, with the support of community, with support of council, we uh, really were able to hit the ground running and not only negotiating that deal, but you know, getting into the industry, whether it was gray market and, um, or you know, with the vision of eventually getting that um, uh, into the le legal world. Uh, one interesting note, actually, when we were going through that community engagement, I was curious one time we had, you know, a, a, a pack gym and I said, okay, well, my dad is always hounding me about putting like a liquor store or a, or a cold beer and wine on reserve. And I, and I said, okay, well, I have a question for the membership. I'm just really curious about this. We have full support for cannabis. What does everybody think about alcohol? And 100% um, refusal. It's very interesting. So you have the support for cannabis, which membership considers a medicine, and then you have unanimous opposition to um, to alcohol. You know, alcohol is bad for First Nation communities. When we've seen the impacts that it's had in every single one of our communities, and it and it you know really helped me as a leader, uh, you know, just stay away from that world and feel comfortable about it because there was you know pressure being put on by some people in the world but I mean if our elders don't want it uh, it's, it's pretty tough to support and and that's something to keep in mind for anybody out there uh, just a tidbit of information about WLFN. So here's a picture uh, of the construction phase of our first building. We got, uh, we partnered up with Indigenous Bloom and that sovereign mod, that sovereign model, the uh, gray market world. Uh, you can see the parking lot and building, very simple stuff. Uh, we were able to hire a local contractor to build the building. Uh, we hired our civil construction company to come in and do the necessary upgrades it's to the parking lot and driveway leading into the store. And, and previous to uh, building on this site, this was just a derelict piece of property, uh, First Nation owned that was our reserve land that was within the city of Williams Lake in a semi-industrial area. Uh, what we've seen is, you know, Williams Lake a difficult political atmosphere, um, probably put it, putting it lightly, but the amount of opposition that we had from the city of Williams Lake when we started going down this road uh, and into our cultivation strategy, the amount of pushback and, and the amount of discussions that we had to have with the city of Williams Lake to, you know, make sure that they were comfortable um, was, was, was pretty interesting. Although, though, although they have no jurisdiction over these lands, these are federal lands and they're WLFN lands, uh, they thought they were able to dictate to us how we you know, develop and build out those reserves. So it was a bit of an education for them that they don't have any say. And we stood firm, although we listened to their feedback. Uh, we uh, did what we want and that was, you know, we know that we're very capable. Uh, we, are, we are a very capable government with a very, uh, very capable staff. And we knew the buildup was going to be, you know, one of the nicer developments within the city of Williams Lake. Uh, but, you know, you have that uh, uh, misconception uh, that, that, that it wouldn't be. And that's something that we're trying to change for our region. You know, people believing in um, what First Nations are doing and supporting what First Nations are doing. I look at all the amount of development that we have within the city of Williams Lake right now, and uh, it's over $17 million. You know, 15 million of that is uh, own source revenue. So that puts us to be one of the biggest developers within the city of Williams Lake. And what we're seeing is, uh, is people are starting to become believers. And that's what we want. I mean, that's really an education. Reconciliation is an education. And that's part of this process for us as well. It's to educate those non-First Nations people and leaders to uh, be supportive and, and, and help First Nations people any way that they can. So here's the, the first rendition of the store, which was Indigenous Bloom. Of course, we've talked about some problems that we had with this organization and, and, and issues uh, over the course of our relationship with them. In our first year, we did st a staggering amount of sa sales. Uh, 
um, to which the, the government seen very little, if not none in the form of a profit share. Some of the problems that we talked about, of course, was making sure that we had a product going out that was, you know, Health Canada certified, that was safe. Uh, in one instance, which really, you know, kicked us, kicked off our, um, you know, urgency to sign our own agreement and get into the legal world, was we had a moldy shipment of gummies come in. And I mean, this was really scary to think about. I mean, we're not, you know, under the sovereign model, under this gray, in this gray market world, we're, uh, you know, it, we're, uninsurable pretty much and and this is a product that went out to customers coming in and we questioned indigenous bloom on why there is these 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 gummies were moldy these edibles were moldy which at the time were one of our number one best sellers uh, they said oh we changed the recipe don't worry we'll be changing it back it's no big deal uh, just remove those ones from the shelf and get them in and i mean that really raised some further alarm bells in our eyes where we're saying uh, this is scary. I mean, the amount of check boxes that are required in order to get a product out on the shelves and, and approved by Health Canada is is obviously a process. They're not starting if they're just changing the recipe on a whim, and it results in you know a product going out there that we could be sued for and are liable for as a as a government. So that's when we really started pressuring uh, the province of British Columbia uh, and started going down the path, uh, you know, getting to that next level. Uh, being illegal just wasn't cutting and not being able to see and feel and touch the money that we were generating in our own bank account was, uh, you know, also getting very scary. So the door to the section 119 opened. In the summer of 2019, the province reconsidered its position on section 119 agreements. They knew we'd been banging on the door. Uh, they knew that we uh, were very progressive and proactive and wanted to be one of the first ones done. Uh, the, the, the province's mandate was very limited. That was a challenge for us uh, in negotiating the agreement. There just wasn't enough in that basket for us to move forward and we continued to bang on the table. How many meetings that, uh, you know, I was down and Kirk was down uh, uh, in Victoria meeting with uh, Minister Farnworth and, and meeting with the uh, the negotiating group and, and just pushing the envelope and asking for more uh, was, you know, very overwhelming and it took a lot of our time. And as you had mentioned at the start of our presentation today, you know, the, the time is, is of a value and the amount that we spent on negotiating was nearly enough as what they compensated us or provided us for capacity funding when we were going down this route. Just think about the legal fees that were accrued through this from our legal counsel that we brought on board um, to support us. Uh, I mean, it just didn't nearly cover the cost. And, and that's something to keep in mind as we're going down this path is, uh, you know, blazing this trail and, and making this, gut, this this agreement available so that other communities could use it as a template so they're not having to, you know, grind it out like we did, so to speak, uh, during the process. So for us, I mean, we understood the importance of getting a retail agreement with the province, but we also understood the importance of what our vision was. Our vision was a farm to gate facility, farm to gate sales, very key. Uh, so we want to produce extremely high quality cannabis that can be bought directly from the facility where it is grown, which is farm to gate, seed to sale. Uh, it's not yet legal in British Columbia. You've seen, we see one has popped up in Ontario. They're kind of leading the way in regards to farm to gate. We began uh, down this path is what we wanted. And we began designing a cultivation facility with the goal of integrating this facility into the, into our section 119 agreement. And it was a part of the, you know, the communication and dialogue that we had when we were negotiating throughout. So we closed the deal October, 2020. Um, which was awesome president setting first uh, cannabis government to government agreement in first nation communities in the country uh, raised our profile, so to speak, uh, it got us into the legal market, we transitioned over to our own brand, which will be coming up soon. Uh, so we agreed to be governed by the provincial le legislation, even on reserve, as mentioned, some of the key components of our agreement, the ability to farm gate sales. Uh, we're going to be the first one to do that um, moving forward until next year. They've made a commitment that they're going to open it up for the rest of the province. So we're going to have uh, a really cool opportunity. We do start selling um, later this summer, or we do start growing later this summer, sorry. So we have the, we have the ability to have a tied house to grow and sell. 
So everything that we grow in our cultivation facility, we're going to be able to um, move into our stores, which is pretty cool. That eliminates the liquor distribution branch that creates more margin for us, which means more profit, which means more opportunity for us to invest in our community. Very key. Uh, so we have the ability to migrate, of course, the product from the cultivation facility into those stores. Uh, we have the ability to have up to eight licenses uh, in a somewhat expedited process anywhere we want in the province, as long as you have municipal or First Nation approval. We have that Me Too clause if someone is able to negotiate a better agreement than us. I mean, it's really cool. And we will look at the expansion of our uh, retail um, brand. Uh, we're looking at expanding into Merit. Uh, we're looking at expanding into the Okanagan. And what we're gonna be able to do as, as discussed here, as mentioned here is what we grow will be able to sell in our stores and 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 that's really cool and then that's going to evolve i think in first nation communities as we look at you know historically we used to trade amongst ourselves and as more communities start to cultivate i think it's going to kick down the door that we're going to be able to look at doing that into the future too eliminating like i said the liquor distribution branch in, in, in the province and uh, you know, creating more margins for our communities which means more profit and again what we're doing with our cannabis revenue is really neat uh, I'll give you an example, like this year uh, and last year, we were able to fund 100% of our post-secondary applicants. You know, that's an investment uh, into our membership, of course, but I mean, those numbers are staggering. I look at the amount of post-secondary applicants that we had this year, and it was over $130,000 that we had to invest in own source revenue to, to, to make sure that everybody that wants to go to school has opportunity. We've been able to invest in, you know, trades training, anybody that wants to go away to, you know, like carpentry or um, or uh, le electrical or any of the trades. I mean, that's that's stuff that's funded at WLFN so that they don't have to worry about, um, you know, paying for their living expenses during the course of their apprenticeship. Uh, there's a number of different things that we're using those 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 dollars for, including incubating ourselves for future growth in the industry. So we also have the ability to buy directly from uh, licensed producers. We must purchase through the LDB except for, um, except for our own products. So everything that we sell in our store, our, our, our retail store, under this agreement, we have to procure from the province of British Columbia through the liquor distribution branch, except of course, what we grow ourselves in our own cultivation facility. We get a reduction in fees, taxes, and charges, uh, product set-asides to mm -hmm. ensure supply of high demand product for WLFN. That's pretty cool. The ability to sell products other than cannabis out of the WFL and retail outlets uh, with, with a limited exception for cultural products, which may be sold from the farm to gate facility. Uh, something else, I mean, there's so many restrictions. Uh, the relaxation of the rules uh, in respect to advertising or promotion. Like when we look at how challenging it is in the cannabis industry, industry to market your store, I mean, you just can't, uh, you know, you can't put out ads in the, the, the you can't put out ads in the um, in the newspaper, for example. Oh, sorry. Um, this isn't in the agreement. Yes, Kirk, sorry. Kirk has corrected me here. These are things that aren't in the agreement that we continue to lobby for. Um, and we try to push the envelope as much as we can on this stuff. Like, uh, I, I keep thinking that it's in the agreement because we keep bringing it up to government and we keep pushing it on other First Nations to also help lobby for this stuff. But, um, but it isn't in. You know, like we've been really pushing the envelope on, on, you know, the reduction of the fees and the taxes on the marketing side. We've been putting up billboards, for example. We've been, uh, we've bought this VW uh, van that's decked out in, uh, in our retail store brand and our cultivation uh, store, our, our facility, and we've been driving it all over town and it's been raising the awareness and getting the word out there. You know, the, the number of, uh, of press that we get as a, um, as you know, a leader in the industry has been really good for us in like raising that profile. Uh, all key things. And again, I mean, we uh, we continue to to push on these things because we know how important they are to the success of every single other First Nation that wants to go down this route. I mean, it's very challenging to compete with that gray market world, and 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 that's what's deterred other First Nation communities to. Um, 
uh, to go down that route. But, you know, peace of mind with, you know, a healthy product with uh, being able to open a bank account, have insurance, those are like the big ticket items for us. But it's these other things that are also going to contribute. And the more First Nations that step up and say, yeah, I want an agreement, but I also want these other things. And with our Me Too clause, we'll be able to incorporate them into our, our agreement. We're already seeing the evolution in the industry around these agreements. I think uh, the, the better off it's going to be and the more communities you're going to see move over into this in, in, into this world. And, and, and that's going to be very key to the success of every single one of these stores because it is challenging. Without our farm to gate um, model, uh, we, um, you know, it, it would be challenging on a store to store basis because it is such a uh, competitive market. Now that we're in the legal, legalized world, uh, we're competing against four four or five other stores within the city of Williams Lake. You look at any of these markets across the province and uh, you know, they're very saturated and that's what we're keeping in mind. You got to get in there and you got to slug it out and, and you have to you know, be better and over and above. And if the province wants First Nations communities to be successful, they have to start you know, cutting us some slack on some of these things that, you, that are mentioned in this slide that are not um, uh, officially in the agreement as of yet. Thanks for that clarity, Kirk. I was just in the zone there. Uh, so here's our, uh, our our retail brand. I didn't mention it yet. It's called Unity Cannabis. Uh, we have a really cool logo. It was neat, actually. We were at one of the local uh, 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 clothing retail outlets. Very successful person, in the city of Williams Lake. Uh, she's you know quickly becoming uh, one of the bigger retail stores in in, in the region. Uh, still North Design. A, a, a really cool story, uh, a lady, she started in the basement of her home and now she's got this big store actually just down the street from us here. And we're looking for a, a logo for a, for a design, for a name for our retail store. And she said, you know, it would be cool. She said, the unity. And, and we we're just like, whoa, that actually does sound really cool. And then we had our Facebook moment where we said, yes, but remove the... So it's just unity. And we thought that was really funny and we laughed and we joked and we, um, we said that that actually sounds pretty good. So that's what we went with, you know, and, and, and as we continue to, to look at our relationships with, you know, our non first nation neighbors, like I said, I mean, it's a, it's a challenging uh, region here in Williams Lake. There's 15 first nation communities that surround the city of Williams Lake and, and is the hub but the relationship, there's always been tension with the local you know, mayor and, and council and municipalities here and rebuilding those and, 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 and taking that unity approach has taken time, but we've made really good strides. Just a couple of weeks ago, we were able to uncover uh, and, and name a brand new bridge in the city of Williams Lake, the Nakusum Bridge, which means unity. And I thought that was really neat. It kind of ties into our brand and our vision and what our council wants in, in bringing people together and working together and, and really embracing, you know, uh, reconciliation and, 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 and what it means. And that's, you know, it's, it's an education first and foremost. People have to embrace it and welcome it and actually want to uh, get educated and, and learn and, and move together in unity. So it has a number of different meanings, uh, very passionate about it and very proud. And I think it's a pretty trendy logo as well. So here's some pictures of our opening and of our store as we went through this rebrand. We brought in an interior decorator in. She's been handling the, um, the rollout of all of our stores. She actually did the interior decorating in our downtown office, which is you know just a few here two years old. She's doing the interior decorating her brand new administration building out at uh, WLFN IR number one. Uh, and I couldn't be more happy with the work that she put together here. You know, it's a very warm, you know, welcoming uh, design, like a more of a boutique model that, uh, you know, when you go into a cannabis store, you want to be able to feel welcome and not like you're breaking the law. And I think that's uh, what we were able to, to deliver with um, with, with our experience at Unity. See some more pictures, very earthy, um, how do you say, hippy dippy <laughs> to an extent. <laughs> but the compliments have been uh, awesome. I think, uh, you know, what you see is it's not like your typical uh, cannabis user, the stereotype with the Rafa hats and the, um, the, the long hair, uh, it's, um, 
it's it's people of all walks of the world that are that are buying cannabis at these stores because they do recognize it as a medicine they do recognize it as something that you know can help them you know take away that anxiety or, or help them with muscle cramps or help them with uh you know whatever ailments they have and of course there's a recreational user too but it was it's been very interesting to see the different clientele that comes into the stores and, and, and you know the feedback that we've been getting from them about our experience that we give them at unity so it's more than three weeks in now but uh when we were three weeks into our uh, uh into our agreement uh you know we were first entity to obtain bank banking for cannabis retail to the 119 agreement where we were fully insured uh our sales were were much lower than they were in in that gray market world that same product so you have you're not able to charge at a lower rate you don't have the same um, milligrams per dose in our edibles for example or two big ones uh, factoring in a, the split that we you know, when i say split with um, that we had with our partners at the time the margins are similar to what we're getting at this gray market store or that we were getting at the gray market store compared to our legal store at unity uh, farm to gate is going to be very key to our profitability moving forward but you know what we've seen over the past year running this store is that uh you know our sales continue to climb our clientele continues to climb and it's because of that experience that we give them but it's also because i think we're becoming an established brand in the region and again uh, people are starting to believe in what we're doing we always used to put on anything that we that we put out earlier uh in a, in my political career um uh doubt us now and it was something that uh, that uh, we picked up from, of course, Conor McGregor, my, fa my favorite and Kirk's favorite UFC fighter. Uh, but uh, there was always doubt, you know, people talk the talk, but we continue to walk the walk and we're making people believers, whether it's, you know, our commercial residential development project that's now seeing our residential take off and leasing on First Nation land was this this is bad just not something accepted by the region we're starting to see uptake on that and like i said a residential takeoff and a commercial starting to gain a ton of interest uh our, our our cannabis initiatives and building out ir6 and you know the construction of our new administration building and uh you know, people are saying like wow these guys are becoming a powerhouse we do need to start believing in what we're doing and what it's contributing to i think is you know uh, the increase in the continued trend upward in our sales at uh, unity cannabis we just hit a million dollars in um gross revenue the other day and and that was a very uh, exciting feeling you know it's it's a very empowering feeling uh i couldn't be more proud of the team and, and, and proud of um you know the support that we get from council and community so we're making haste to get going of course uh, producing our own product and selling it through the farm to get outlet in our own retail facilities we're going to it's going to be a game changer for us as mentioned uh, it creates really neat opportunities around cannabis tourism you know craft cannabis just think about it like i been on wine tours before and that was kind of a neat experience you know i'm not a big time wine drinker but the experience of wine touring was something that i'll never forget and this is something you know that just like craft um, beer, we're going to see, I think, this trending upwards in craft cannabis as people start to get more, you know, comfortable with uh, with this industry. Farm to Gate allows us to create our own cannabis brand, which is pretty cool. Um, build a skilled workforce and have pride in our own identity. I mean, that's a key thing, identifying ourselves as being a champion in this industry, but um, the product and, and just owning that and, and having people talk about it for our membership is you know, a very empowering feeling for them as well. You take pride in, in your community and what you do, and that helps you heal as, a, as an individual. So the world is watching what we're doing at Farm to Gay right now. Our facility is going to be up and running in August. We just hired our master grower really cool awesome dude from ontario he's going to be here uh at the start of august to really kick us off in, in, in that growing journey that we're going to have here's a couple pictures pictures of what our cultivation facility at sugar king cannabis is going to look like uh again you know uh 
the rusty bucket and I'll throw her a plug, Reem Johnson. She's the one that helped us uh, design, did the interior decorating on the store and really put the finishing touches and, and give it that feeling of, of warmth and, and uh, professionalism at the same time. You can see in our retail outlet, so we have Unity, the retail store right beside it is our cultivation facility where we're going to have a micro grow license. So we're going to be able to grow up to 650 kilos of cannabis per year, that premium product, uh, very key. But uh, there's also going to be a retail store um, in our cultivation facility. So you're going to be able to go in there, buy our premium product. And as you can see, there's going to be a viewing area into one of the grow rooms. So you're going to see exactly what a grow room looks like which is kind of cool. I, I like, I don't uh, grow cannabis myself, but when we were doing the research around this stuff, we, uh, we toured multiple micro grow facilities and it's a very interesting world. It's a very, um, you know, what used to be illegal and bad and, and, and taboo is now legal. So you're in these facilities, you're walking around with your uh, little hairnet and gloves and booties and, and, and gowns is just so bizarre. <laughs> I was having this discussion with my mom the other day and, and my cousin who are um, historical cannabis users, but uh, not anymore. Uh, but, uh, you know, they're saying this is so bizarre. Who would have thought, you know, from back in the day that we're going to be sitting with, um, with you having the discussion on legalized cannabis and WLFN growing themselves in this industry? And I go, no doubt. It's so crazy, but it's really cool and it's been really exciting stuff. Uh, you know, it's um, it's something that's really going to help change the trajectory of the Williams like First Nation in a number of different ways, of course. We're, um, you know, here's another one of those uh, interior pictures where you're going to be able to see in that grow room and give you an idea on what our retail store is going to look like at Sugarcane Cannabis small uh you know you're going to be able to purchase that premium product and and, and again uh, see into those grow rooms and it's really neat we're going to be able to tell a story through this and the the master grower that we're actually bringing on board he is a wonderful storyteller uh, uh so it's going to be interesting on you know the experience that people get when they come into that store and they're going to be able to talk about it uh, moving forward because uh you know it's all about that story. So here's a, a drone flyover that we have on our Facebook site, Sugar King Cannabis, and it's running through uh, some early construction videos uh, that we that we have up. If you wanted to take a look, it's on our Sugar King Cannabis site, but um, but it shows the you know the the paving, the uh, what the site looks like, its uh, location, uh, the amount of detail we put in on on all of it now it's actually really neat and if you go to our site you'll be able to get a better idea on the work that's been done since this original video came out uh but you know the landscaping is starting to go in the lights are on uh, it's really lit up this what was a former piece of you know derelict land that uh was just it was literally a waste site here's a couple of more pictures of some of that landscaping that i just mentioned and and some of the internal pictures of the finishing touches as we continue to ramp up for completion uh i guess they should throw another plug out to lauren brothers who did the construction or performed the construction of this facility a local contractor uh, another one of the success stories that we've had in the region like this is a resource-based economy in williams lake it's mining it's uh it's it's mills and what we're doing here is we're helping diversify the economy we're doing that by you know getting into the cannabis industry but we also have been able to take great pride in delivering these these projects with local subs local contractors so that money is staying right here and I think that is something that has also helped, you know, make people believers from the region is that, uh, you know, the amount of money that we're pumping out into, into doing things in community is all staying here. It's getting spent at those local stores, the millions of dollars that we have in the ground right now. And they're saying, wow, Williams Lake is doing great things. And the amount of, you know, pats in the back that I get personally when I'm out there in the general public about the awesome things that we're doing, I always make sure and say, well, it's not just me. I am one person on a six person council and they 
they should be getting just as much credit as I am. Uh, because even though I'm a very good speaker, uh, you know, it's them that keeps me in check and it's them that you know, votes on these decisions at the end of the day and supports everything that our staff is, uh, is doing. And I just, you know, I, I find it very, um, I think very key for me to mention that because uh, we wouldn't be able to do it without them as well. Okay, so that's the end of our presentation. Uh, <laughs> I was like, I was telling Kirk earlier, I was saying, I think we got about 15 minutes, so we'll try and keep it short and keep it tight. And now we've, we're about 45 minutes in, which is uh, <laughs> over time in my estimation, but under time in what was uh, proposed. So uh, I'd like to open it up for questions now. Awesome, uh, remarkable presentation. I, I definitely feel like you are one to watch, you and your community. Um, just what you're doing, blazing the trail in the cannabis industry. <laughs> so awesome. Uh, okay, so Darren has his hand up. I know in the chat box there, there's lots of questions, so we will get to you. But Darren, since you have your hand up, um, let's go with you first, and then we'll go to the questions that are in the chat box. Alrighty, that was great. Thanks for that uh, presentation. I'm really happy to hear today. I have a, a pretty different, um, I guess, experience with my band and with, um, I guess, approaching this project that I'm currently, like, I initially started like gung ho, like trying to like source money to like hire like grower IQ to like, you know, get everything kind of running and get things going so we can start breaking down ground like to get building and stuff to get into the market but then in through doing my research and it's it gets ex extremely complicated for indigenous bands interacting with uh the government right and this is perfect because you're speaking about this section 119 negotiations and i haven't been able to find that on the internet so i i'm not really um pre to this and I just haven't seen like anything or like where, where would I find that? That's my first question. I, I have a couple more. You want me to answer that, Chief? Um, so Darren, I guess in just in answer to your question, section 119 refers to a section of the Cannabis Control and Licensing Act. There's two kind of key oh, okay. pieces of legislation that regulate um, cannabis retail in British Columbia. So what happened when they passed the Federal Cannabis Act um, is they delegated responsibility to the province, provinces to manage retail. Um, and in British Columbia, uh, the, the two pieces of legislation that the province enacted to, to govern cannabis retail are the Cannabis Control and Licensing Act and the Cannabis Distribution Act. Different provinces across the country enacted different legislation. Some of them have comparable provisions or are willing to make comparable commitments. Others haven't gotten there yet, but in British Columbia, um, section 119 refers to a section of the Cannabis Control and Licensing Act. It says that the province can enter into an agreement with an indigenous nation with respect to cannabis retail that modifies the way the law works. And it gives them pretty broad discretion to do whatever they want, to, to exempt um, or modify almost all elements um, uh, of the law around cannabis retail, except for the fact that it still has to preserve the commitment to avoid the involvement of organized crime, to avoid the sale from minors, to ensure that product is procured from a, a licensed producer um, and that proper records are kept. Those are the key pillars, but around that, the province can do whatever they want. They can modify fees, they can allow you to procure directly, theoretically, but in British Columbia, they haven't got a mandate to do anything too wild yet. And other provinces, to the best of my knowledge, haven't really rolled up their sleeves and entered into government to government agreements with First Nations. Ours is pretty much the first of which we're aware across the country uh, around cannabis. So that's what we refer to when we're talking about Section 119. It refers to the provincial law uh, and the commitment of the provincial government in British Columbia to enter into agreements with Indigenous nations around cannabis. And it isn't with Indigenous individuals, it's only with governments that they would enter into those agreements. Okay. Perfect. Another neat tidbit of information too, I mean, when we're going down this path and because we're 
blazing the trail. We uh, we were able to, to to lobby government to help us out in the construction of our cultivation facility. So we were able to secure uh, 500,000 uh, in grant funding from the province of British Columbia to go towards the construction of that building. And then we we're also able to secure uh, just over 200K out of the federal government and another $250,000 out of Northern Development Initiative Trust, which is the first cannabis initiative that they've supported uh, through this grant process. I thought that was really, uh, you know, something to to hold up and, and it was good to see them supporting some of these initiatives that we continue to lobby for. Great. Um, one last thing. Oh, sorry. Is go that it? it? Am I cut off? Go for it. No, go okay. for it. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, I just needed a bit of clarity on the the sovereign approach i guess that's that's where this section 119 is coming in from for taking that approach and this only applies to retail i i was um more uh geared towards the micro cultivation facility and how that is articulating through engagements with the government i guess you know and and is that covered in section 119? I know he, he specified, um, is, is it being retail only? And um... it, it is covered there and in, in, in the, so it's a critical part and probably the part that the province was most resistant about because in British Columbia and some other provinces, not all of them, um, the presumption is you can't have what they call a tied house. You can't be involved in the business of both cultivation and retail. We were already involved in retail, so the presumption was that we couldn't be involved in cultivation. So our agreement, our government to government agreement, it said, no, you can be engaged in both um, and you can sell the product that you produce at your facility directly from the store. That model um, isn't done anywhere else. It's, the chief has mentioned they just opened it up in Ontario. There is one cultivator, Thrive, that has a small farm gate outlet in one of their fields. Um, but it's not allowed anywhere else yet. And, and it is not generally allowed in British Columbia, although they're working on a, on a framework to do it. So our agreement does specifically reference our micro cultivation facility and says that it says, we agree that you can sell from this specific facility. Um, and it describes it with some precision and limits it. Uh, the micro cultivation category of licenses is limited to 650 kilograms of cannabis. So right now, um, our, our agreement says that we can sell up to that quantity. Although there is one other time limited section 119 agreement in British Columbia now with Cowichan, and there's, um, they're involved with a partner that has a standard license. So theirs is a bit different than ours. And so there probably already is uh, some room for expansion of our agreement. Thanks very much, Kirk. I appreciate You're welcome. That. And we'll again, that's amazing. Yeah, thanks for your question, Darren. Um, okay, so we're going to the chat box. I know we have a couple of moments left. I know there's actually tons of questions here. Cindy, she had to leave on an important phone call, but she's recording this um, so because she's awaiting these the answer. So uh, her community is in the process of developing a cannabis operation, beginning with greenhouses after the grounds are stable and stabilized enough for building. And her question, one of her questions, are, are there any kinds of processing that we need to be aware of where legalization is concerned? Is that around, like, are they planning on going through the Health Canada route around cultivation or, I mean, there's uh, different licenses that I guess you'd need to get in regards to processing or an ex extraction or cultivation. I mean, right now we're going down the, the, the licensing process for cultivation through that micro licensing um, route. Uh, but um, as for processing and, 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 and anything else, uh, we would have to get additional permits as far as I understand. Kirk can correct me on this one. Yeah, so I mean, if the question is generally about processes that we have to comply with, so our, on the retail side, we are authorized by the province of British Columbia pursuant to our agreement. Our, our store on reserve, we don't call it a license because we don't like that language. It's called an authorization, but it is authorized pursuant to our section 119 agreement. So we have a provincial authorization. So there's process around that that we had to go through under our agreement. Um, and then on the federal side, when we're doing cultivation, 
Of course, it's heavily regulated under federal law, and Health Canada is the entity that that administers that. So, yeah, everything we do there is heavily regulated, and that's why you spend a lot of money on construction and consultants and uh, architects and uh, all of those kind of people because it's it's a very very regulated industry, and that's why quite quite frankly, it's very difficult to break in. It's very complicated. Um, it's very uh, you know paper intensive. Uh, and it's very costly because you can't just throw something up and, and expect that you could start growing cannabis. So a lot of a lot of work in there for sure. Okay, thank you. She has three other questions that I'm going to ask, and feel free to uh, pick one out. Um, and then there's a couple more questions that I really think it's important to get to. So, is there any difficulties where having a dispensary is de developed? where having a dispensary is developed. So that's question number one. What kind of equipment is important to ensure a successful growth of cannabis? Um, three, what resistance is there with the municipalities and the public and how do you handle it? I think you, you, I think you kind of touched on that. So those are three of her remaining questions that she has. I, I'll just quickly touch on them because we could spend a lot of time talking about each of them. There are challenges around, sure, a, a dispensary, technically under provincial law, we're not allowed to call it a dispensary, it's cannabis retail, um, because uh, the, the, the provincial law is, you, you keep, dispensary refers to something that's medical and we're not allowed to do that, but you, it's a cannabis retail outlet. Sure, there are considerations, you know, um, we have the ability on reserve to develop our own rules and we set rules around that. Um, and so we have to go through a series of considerations under our law about the implications for um, other land uses around it, like residential housing, schools, and those kind of things and ensure that it doesn't cause damage to those other uses. In most municipalities, if you're setting up off reserve, they have bylaws that, that govern how you can set it up. And it's not dissimilar from our, our First Nations law but usually there are proximity limitations that say you can't be within a certain number of meters of a school or a recreation a recreational facility or potentially another licensee. So there are always considerations that you have to look into, practical business considerations, and then land use considerations primarily. So yeah, lots of things that you have to think about and you always wanna make sure that you're, you're putting something that's appropriate in a place that's appropriate. And that's the good thing about this piece of land as the chief indicated that we did our first store on. Um, it was, just industrial land. And certainly we've beautified this whole area. You can see it through what we're doing um, and it's it, it faces out onto the lake. So it's a great uh, spot to put it. Um, and we're doing another store in Merritt. And then tomorrow I'm going down to look at locations in Vernon and Penticton. And so those are all in municipal jurisdiction. So they won't be on reserve. Um, so it, it will be interesting, a different experience and we have to get the approval of those local governments. Well, two of the locations are already approved, one is not. So um, yeah, it, it's challenging. Uh, and so there's a lot of factors that go into the hopper there. In terms of kinds of equipment, once again, lots of considerations, expensive business, um, make sure that your facility is designed correctly, make sure that you have a good consultant to help you. And that's part of the magic in this process is finding the right people. And we're fortunate to source the right people. You obviously have to have good grow equipment. We are doing something innovative in that we're the first, um, we're the first party of any kind, not just First Nation, to collaborate with BC Hydro and to use uh, LED technology through a BC Hydro collaboration for our growing. So we use low energy um, LED lights uh, that are very expensive, by the way, in our facility, but BC Hydro is providing us with a partial rebate. So lots of important things from your irrigation to your lighting to your racking, but the key thing is people, you know, find the right grower. And um, the final question talking about resistance with municipalities, the chief alluded to it, there are, there are often these challenges. What we got, ironically, when we, we built our cultivation facility, we got huge resistance from the city that we were gonna ruin the whole city. And it's gonna be ugly and it's gonna be just, it's gonna bring down land values. And you can see what our facility looks like. It's a thousand times nicer than anything in the city of Williams Lake. And it is by far the nicest facility in the entire town. So that was just sort of anti-First Nation sentiment that was unfortunately spun you know, by some particular members of city council. They've since eaten their words. And when we're, we're operational, um, you know, I, I think 
everyone will sort of look back at how ridiculous those comments were. But we were, you know, I think when dealing with local governments, you have to be respectful, but but firm too, especially if you're developing on your own lands, um, because you know governments should respect other governments' jurisdictions, and they shouldn't have the right to beat you down like they attempted to do in Williams Lake. So I don't know whether the chief wants to add to that, but that's my quick answer to those questions. No, I think you've captured it quite well, Kirk. Uh, he's very eloquent in how he describes things. Uh, he's a lawyer by trade, and he's very well spoken and has an amazing handle on the work that's being done. As you can see, he had mentioned uh, that you know finding the right consultants. I mean, we have uh, you know, amazing staff that you know, do the work of. 10 consultants and that's something that we're blessed with at WLF and bringing in that outside help to help us push these things over the goal goal line are also very key and what we found in our research and in getting out there and wanting to get into the end industry was like you know it was it was kind of the wild west back when we first started inquiring about cannabis and, and everybody that we talked to was like you know minimum hundred thousand that's what it's going to take for us to do this. That what's their cost? It's like ten thousand for this and twenty thousand for that and thirty thousand for this. And that's you know those are just consultant fees. It was very staggering numbers, and we quickly became equipped in the industry and did a lot of the heavy lifting on our own, which we could take great pride in, of course. But finding the right people to to navigate these things is very going to be very key to success um, in every single community that is going down this route. Wow. Okay, I know we're over time. I just, we have two questions. I feel like they can be answered pretty fast. Um, one of our guests had asked about, regarding slide 10, ability to have up to eight licenses on reserve on anywhere in province. So uh, the ask is, that is for retail store permits? Yes. Okay. And then the second question, regarding slide 11, reduction in fees, taxes, or charges. Is there any additional benefits to community members purchasing from your store versus off-reserve private retailer? What we're seeing is uh, we, um, you know, we have the, the status discount. I mean, that's the immediate benefit for, for any First Nations coming into the store. And our staff has the ability to give further discounts on top of that. And, you know, sometimes they give more discounts than they should, but, you know, as long as we see them going to band members, I mean, it's, we're completely comfortable with moving forward as long as they have the, um, you know, the, the, the wherewithal to, to make sure they're not taking advantage of what they're giving out for discounts. Again, I mean, we're a business at the end of the day, we need to make uh, money to survive. And, and that's something that's been, uh, told to the staff moving forward. I mean, what the community sees as benefits is on the back end in regards to our, uh, you know, I just mentioned, you know, one thing in regards to post-secondary applications and what that canvas money goes to, but I mean, we're doing some other really cool things too. Like uh, as we look at where the world is at nowadays, language, culture, ceremony, revitalization. I mean, all of this stuff takes investment and that's where money is flowing into it so that we can have a fully functional elders group when we're starting to navigate through a response to um, to the investigation at the residential school site close to Williams Lake, for example, we um, we need to consult with their elders and get their guidance. I mean, that's what I've been doing over the past week. And, and because we have a functional elders group that's able to provide direction because we pump funding into, you know, making sure they have a building and they're taken care of and they can gather and, 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 and stuff like that. Um, it's a, uh, it's something that we feel is, you know, going to be a benefit to the community and, and it shows the, the worth and contributes to the health and all of that stuff is, is getting done through on source revenue, you know, dollars like these cannabis ones and the other businesses and agreements that we're able to put together with proponents in the territory. So those are the benefits. Uh, going to be more moving forward, of course, as we continue to grow ourselves in this industry. And those are some more positives that we like to stress, not to mention the employment opportunities. The majority of the people that are working in, these st in, in our store and will be working in our cultivation facility, and even the urban members that are living in these other cities that we're going to be moving into I mean, are going to be band members. And that's something to keep in mind as well. Employment, providing careers and an opportunity for people to provide for their families. That's really cool. And that's, uh, you know, a part of the, uh, uh, the motivation for them to continue to support because they're seeing the benefits firsthand. 
I I feel like our time is up. I know there's so many other questions. I know that. Um, but I really want to honor and say that we appreciate both of your time. Um, I know time is valuable. Uh, so I just want to say thank you. And, and we see and we hear what you're doing within your community. Um, the facilities are gorgeous, gorgeous. Um, it, it really started from this, this idea, from this visioning, this community consulting and engagement and the hard work, the hustle that you put into making this become a reality. So thank you for sharing what's going on in your community. Um, it's beautiful stuff. So thank you so much. I uh, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. I, I've, I have so many takeaways myself. I hope you do as well. Um, I'm, I believe you, there was a Facebook page on there that I saw in the presentation. Um, so maybe find these folks on Facebook, follow them, see what I think there's that drone that was um, showing the land and the um, what was going on with the building. So follow them, you know, and follow them from afar. And perhaps there's questions that you can send in the in email as well. So thank you all for joining us this afternoon. I hope you have a good rest of the day. Um, again, we honor the creator. We honor the ones who have walked before us. Um, that in today in 2021, we're here, we're able to walk out our dreams. We're able to be well in business and um, whatever we carry and hold in our hearts that's best for us and our communities. And so thank you for inspiring us. Um, so be well, everyone. Take care. Um, walk in peace and harmony. Hi, hi. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy the day.